This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg. Letters of Two Brides by Henri de Balzac. Letter 7. Louise de Chaillot to René de Malcolm. What? To be married so soon? But this is unheard of. At the end of a month you become engaged to a man who is a stranger to you, and about whom you know nothing. The man may be deaf. There are so many kinds of deafness. He may be sickly, tiresome, insufferable. Don't you see, René, what they want with you? You are needful for carrying on the glorious stock of the Lesterades. That is all. You will be buried in the provinces. Are these the promises we made to each other? Were I you, I would sooner set off to the Hieras Islands in a kike, on the chance of being captured by an Algerian corsair and sold to the Grand Turk. Then I should be a sultana some day, and wouldn't I make a stir in the harem while I was young, yes, and afterwards, too. You are leaving one convent to enter another. I know you. You are a coward, and you will submit to the yoke of family life with a lamb-like docility. But I am here to direct you. You must come to Paris. There we shall drive the men wild and hold a court like queens. Your husband, sweetheart, in three years from now may become a member of the chamber. I know all about members now, and I will explain it to you. You will work that machine very well. You can live in Paris, and become there what my mother calls a woman of fashion. Oh, you needn't suppose I will leave you in your grange. MONDAY For a whole fortnight now, my dear, I have been living the life of society, one evening at the Italians, another at the Grand Opera, and always a ball afterwards. Ah, society is a witching world! The music of the opera enchants me, and whilst my soul is plunged in divine pleasure, I am the centre of admiration, and the focus of all the opera-glasses. But a single glance will make the boldest youth drop his eyes. I have seen some charming young men there. All the same, I don't care for any of them. Not one has roused in me the emotion which I feel when I listen to Garcia, in his splendid duet with Pellegrini in Otello. Heavens, how jealous Rossini must have been to express jealousy so well! What a cry in Il mio corsi divide! I'm speaking Greek to you, for you have never heard Garcia, but then you know how jealous I am. What a wretched dramatist Shakespeare is! Othello is in love with glory, he wins battles, he gives orders, he struts about, and is all over the place while Desdemona sits at home, and Desdemona, who sees herself neglected for the silly fuss of public life, is quite meek all the time. Such a sheep deserves to be slaughtered. Let the man whom I deign to love beware how he thinks of anything but loving me. For my part, I like those long trials of the old-fashioned chivalry, that lout of a young lord who took offence because his sovereign lady sent him down among the lions to fetch her glove was, in my opinion, very impertinent, and a fool too. Doubtless the lady had in reserve for him some exquisite flower of love, which he lost, as he well deserved, the puppy. But here I am running on as though I had not a great piece of news to tell you. My father is certainly going to represent our master the king at Madrid— I say our master, for I shall make part of the embassy. My mother wishes to remain here, and my father will take me, so as to have some woman with him. My dear, this seems to you no doubt very simple, but there are horrors behind it all the same. In a fortnight I have probed the secrets of the house. My mother would accompany my father to Madrid, if he would take Monsieur de Canalis as a secretary to the embassy but the king appoints the secretaries. The duke dare neither annoy the king, who hates to be opposed, nor vex my mother, and the wily diplomat believes he has cut the knot by leaving the duchess here. 
Monsieur de Canalis, who is the great poet of the day, is the young man who cultivates my mother's society, and who no doubt studies diplomacy with her from three o'clock to five. Diplomacy must be a fine subject, for he is as regular as a gambler on the stock exchange. The Duc de Retor, our elder brother, solemn, cold, and whimsical, would be extinguished by his father at Madrid, therefore he remains in Paris. Miss Griffith has found out also that Alphonse is in love with a ballet girl at the opera. How is it possible to fall in love with legs and pirouettes? We have noticed that my brother comes to the theatre only when Tullia dances there. He applauds the steps of this creature, and then goes out. Two ballet girls in a family are, I fancy, more destructive than the plague. My second brother is with his regiment, and I have not yet seen him. Thus it comes about that I have to act as the Antigone of His Majesty's ambassador. Perhaps I may get married in Spain, and perhaps my father's idea is a marriage there without dowry, after the pattern of yours with this broken-down guard of honour. My father asked if I would go with him, and offered me the use of his Spanish master. "'Spain, the country for castles in the air!' I cried. "'Perhaps you hope that it may mean marriages for me.' For sole reply he honoured me with a meaning look. For some days he has amused himself with teasing me at lunch. He watches me, and I dissemble. In this way I have played with him cruelly as father and ambassador in petto. Hadn't he taken me for a fool? He asked me what I thought of this and that young man, and of some girls whom I had met in several houses. I replied with quite inane remarks on the colour of their hair, their faces, and the difference in their figures. My father seemed disappointed at my crassness, and inwardly blamed himself for having asked me. "'Still, father,' I added, "'don't suppose I am saying what I really think. Mother made me afraid the other day that I had spoken more frankly than I ought of my impressions. "'With your family you can speak quite freely,' my mother replied. "'Very well, then,' I went on. "'The young men I have met so far strike me as too self-centred to excite interest in others.' they are much more taken up with themselves than with their company. They can't be accused of lack of candour at any rate. They put on a certain expression to talk to us, and drop it again in a moment, apparently satisfied that we don't use our eyes. The man, as he converses, is the lover. Silent, he is the husband. The girls, again, are so artificial that it is impossible to know what they really are, except from the way they dance. Their figures and movements alone are not a sham. But what has alarmed me most in this fashionable society is its brutality. The little incidents which take place when supper is announced give one some idea, to compare small things with great, of what a popular rising might be. Courtesy is only a thin veneer on the general selfishness. I imagined society very different. Women count for little in it. That may, perhaps, be a survival of Bonapartist ideas. "'Armand is coming on extraordinarily,' said my mother. "'Mother, did you think I should never get beyond asking to see Madame de Stahl?' My father smiled, and rose from the table. "'Saturday.' "'My dear, I have left one thing out. "'Here is the tidbit I have reserved for you. "'The love which we pictured must be extremely well hidden. "'I have seen not a trace of it. "'True, I have caught in drawing-rooms now and again "'a quick exchange of glances, "'but how colourless it all is. "'Love, as we imagined it, "'a world of wonders, of glorious dreams, "'of charming realities, of sorrows that waken sympathy, and smiles that make sunshine, does not exist. The bewitching words, the constant interchange of happiness, the misery of absence, the flood of joy at the presence of the beloved one, where are they? What soil produces these radiant flowers of the soul? Which is wrong, we 
or the world. I have already seen hundreds of men, young and middle-aged. Not one has stirred the least feeling in me. No proof of admiration and devotion on their part, not even a sword drawn in my behalf would have moved me. Love, dear, is the product of such rare conditions that it is quite possible to live a lifetime without coming across the being on whom nature has bestowed the power of making one's happiness. The thought is enough to make one shudder, for if this being is found too late, what then? For some days I have begun to tremble when I think of the destiny of women, and to understand why so many wear a sad face beneath the flush brought by the unnatural excitement of social dissipation. Marriage is a mere matter of chance. Look at yours. A storm of wild thoughts has passed over my mind. To be loved every day the same, yet with a difference, to be loved as much after ten years of happiness as on the first day, such a love demands years. The lover must be allowed to languish, curiosity must be piqued and satisfied, feeling roused and responded to. Is there, then, a law for the inner fruits of the heart, as there is for the visible fruits of nature? Can joy be made lasting? In what proportion should love mingle tears with pleasures? The cold policy of the funereal, monotonous, persistent routine of the convent seemed to me at these moments the only real life, while the wealth, the splendour, the tears, the delights, the triumph, the joy, the satisfaction of a love equal, shared, and sanctioned, appeared a mere idle vision. I see no room in this city for the gentle ways of love, for precious walks in shady alleys, the full moon sparkling on the water, while the suppliant pleads in vain. Rich, young, and beautiful, I have only to love, and love would become my sole occupation, my life. Yet in the three months during which I have come and gone, eager and curious, nothing has appealed to me in the bright, covetous, keen eyes around me. No voice has thrilled me, no glance has made the world seem brighter. Music alone has filled my soul, music alone has at all taken the place of our friendship. Sometimes at night I will linger for an hour by my window, gazing into the garden, summoning the future, with all it brings, out of the mystery which shrouds it. There are days, too, when, having started for a drive, I get out and walk in the Champs-Élysées, and picture to myself that the man who is to waken my slumbering soul is at hand, that he will follow and look at me. Then I meet only mountebanks, vendors of gingerbread, jugglers, passers-by hurrying to their business, or lovers who try to escape notice. These I am tempted to stop, asking them, "'You, who are happy, tell me what is love?' But the impulse is repressed, and I return to my carriage, swearing to die an old maid. Love is undoubtedly an incarnation, and how many conditions are needful before it can take place. We are not certain of never quarrelling with ourselves, how much less so when there are two. This is a problem which God alone can solve. I begin to think that I shall return to the convent. If I remain in society, I shall do things which will look like follies, for I cannot possibly reconcile myself to what I see. I am perpetually wounded either in my sense of delicacy, my inner principles, or my secret thoughts. Ah, my mother is the happiest of women, adored as she is by Canali, her great little man. My love, do you know I am seized sometimes with a horrible craving, to know what goes on between my mother and that young man? Griffith tells me she has gone through all these moods. She has longed to fly at women whose happiness was written in their face. She has blackened their character, torn them to pieces. According to her, virtue consists in burying all these savage instincts in one's innermost heart. But what then of the heart? 
it becomes the sink of all that is worst in us. It is very humiliating that no adorer has yet turned up for me. I am a marriageable girl, but I have brothers, a family, relations, who are sensitive on the point of honour. Ah, if that is what keeps men back, they are poltroons. The part of Chimene in The Cid, and that of The Cid delight me. What a marvellous play! Well, good-bye. End of Letter 7 Read by Kara Schallenberg www.kray.org On November 19, 2006, in Oceanside, California.